Okie dokie. Yeah. Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to my shop. We are going to be having a good time tonight. Um, I have this uh, card that I got when I joined uh, Midwest Tool Collectors Association. Midwest Tool Collectors Association is a group of people who get together who buy, sell, trade, and learn about antique tools and particularly hand tools, most commonly woodworking tools. Um, I would say probably about 30% of the tools I have come from meets at the Midwest Tool Collectors Association. And speaking of that, actually, the, uh, the national meet is coming up Lansing, Michigan in, uh, I think it's the 14th, 15th, and 16th of June, and I will be there. Um, so if you want to come see me, um, come on out. And it is a fantastic place. I mean, imagine like a basketball court completely covered in tails, tables, covered in hand tools. And it's like a happiness. Um, so yes, we're going to be making a picture frame to frame this card. It's something I've been wanting to do for a while. A simple picture frame, um, and I'm not looking for anything ornate or anything spectacular and ornately carved. I just want to do something simple and clean. Uh, and I was looking through my stock and I pulled up this piece of hickory. Um, now, hickory is not a great hand tool wood. It is a hard, hard wood to work with. Um, but I really want to do that to show you that even though it's that hard, even though it's difficult to work with, it's something that you still can work with. It's going to take some precautions. It's going to take sharp blades. Um, but we're going to make this out of this. And I think it's like uh, one inch by about an inch and three quarters or so. Um, nothing special. I haven't done anything to this other than um, I had this sitting in my shop milled. Actually, I can see the saw marks on this side. Um, I'll probably smooth those off and clean them off in a little bit. But uh, we want to make this into a picture frame. Um, so uh, the first thing we need to do is create a rabbit. Now in the back of a picture frame there's a recess that allows the picture to fit into the recess. Um, that also lets the glass and any matting and other things like that. And we want it to be deep enough for the glass plus the matting plus the picture that you're going to be putting on plus backing uh, plus pins going into the frame. So the glass I'm going to be using, I don't have yet. Um, sometime in the future, I'm going to go and cut a piece of glass. Uh, but since I don't have it, I'm going to make it whatever size I want. And I'm going to use eighth inch glass. So I know I've got an eighth inch. I'm not going to use any matting. I'm going to be using this sheet. Um, and then I have a piece of uh, um, cardstock that's about a sixteenth inch thick. So if I imagine that the cardstock and the sheet itself are an eighth inch thick plus an eighth inch of glass, that's a quarter inch. And I want enough space for a pin. Uh, so I'm going to put another eighth inch onto there. And if you're in Europe, you're probably yelling at me right now for using all these fractions. I'm sorry for that. <laughs> um, but uh, so that's going to be, uh, what is it, uh, five eighths of an inch deep. Um, and then normally we want about a quarter inch into the frame. So basically we need to create a rabbit into this whole piece that is a quarter inch. Let's see, if we're going to the frame here, we want it to be a quarter inch down into the frame and then five eighths of an inch um, into the, the face of the frame. So I could go and grab my rabbiting plane. Um, ooh, let's see. I got this one, and I could have some fun with that. Um, as you can see, I haven't used it in a while. But not everyone has a rabbiting plane. Um, I could grab my Stanley 45. Not everyone has one of those. Or I could just grab a saw and chisel. And in a recent video, you saw I made um, a groove with just a saw and chisel. You can do the exact same thing with rabbit, and you just cut either side with a saw. It's really a simple task, um, especially if you practice once or twice on a dead board. Um, you can make a really nice, long, clean cut relatively easily and relatively quickly. But I have a Stanley 55. And I really love using this thing. I know not everyone has it, but it's going to be fairly simple to most in setting it up as a rabbit plane. So I'm going to use my Stanley 55. I know, I, I'm spoiled. <laughs> now, another thing I'm doing tonight is I'm trying to set this up with uh, one camera. I'm not using the switcher because I'm testing to see if the sound and my mouth are in the same speed. So if they are, please let me know. Um, if they aren't, well, then please let me know too. I'm trying to figure out what's wrong with that so I can fix it in the future. Um, but we'll see if this works. So I'm going to move the camera over here a little closer since I'm just working with the one camera and show you what I do to set up the Stanley 55 and why this is so cool. Let me zoom in here a moment. Ooh, there we go. Prettiness. Now here's the Stanley 55. I have an entire video on setting it up and using it. And basically, it is two fences on a rod. And then in between that fence, there are two skates. And these two skates in here 
are these two, they're basically the, the souls of the plane. Um, oh shoot, I didn't get rid of all the Allen. Let's see if I can loosen it with that. These have these locking nuts that lock this whole thing in place so that the skates don't move around. And here you can see, uh, once I loosen it up all the way, here you can see the two skates. And these two skates are the sole of the plane. So rather than having a big flat sole, they just have those little skates. And we're going to loosen it up and take this iron out of here, which is, uh, what, 3 eighths, something like that. And I'm going to put in that one. Um, I'm going to make it bigger than I need because I can take off some. And I'm going to put that in there. And I thought about setting this up ahead of time, but a lot of people really want to see this in action and how it all goes together. So what I'm doing is one skate will support one side of the iron. And so I'm going to put this in here and tighten this down. And I also want to eyeball and make sure it's at the right depth. Oop, wrong way. So I don't want to be cutting off too much. And so back here you have this screw which adjusts the depth of the iron. This one locks it down and then you can slide the second skate in here. And the second skate then supports the second, the other side of the wood. And then you can lock that in place. And theoretically, these should be the same distance apart. These two skates should be the same distance apart all the way across. And I, I relatively trust this one. It's a very well-maintained and set up um, set, so I don't have to worry about it too much. Um, but if you don't, then you can check its width here and check its width here. Now, I don't need the second fence on this particular setup. I rarely need the second fence, so I'm just going to use this first one. And with each fence, there are two holes. If I put it in the bottom set of holes, then the fence runs up against the side of the iron. If I put it in the top set of holes, then the fence actually goes underneath the iron. And this allows me to then cut only a section of the iron. Now, what I'm going to be doing here, let me grab the scrap that's a little bit, yeah, my scrap is gone. Oh, where's the scrap gone? Oh, well. Uh, so let me show you this. So what I want to do into this is I want to cut, uh, I want to cut in, um, let's see, what did I say, 5 eighths of an inch in. And then I want to cut down a quarter inch. And so I, I don't want it to be as, I want it to be shallow and wide in this direction. We kind of think about that backwards, but I want to have enough space for, no. No, I don't want 5 eighths of an inch. What did I say? A quarter inch plus an eighth inch. That's 3 eighths of an inch. Ah, oh, fractions getting in the way. So I want to come in 3 eighths of an inch this way and a quarter inch this way. Um, so what I'm going to do is set up this blade so that 3 eighths of an inch is showing on the iron so that the fence is pulled back. Let me show, flip it over this way. So the fence is pulled back so 3 eighths of an inch is showing. And then I'm going to set this depth stop to a quarter inch. So let me set this down and grab my tape measure. I don't always use this. Actually, I rarely use a tape measure. So I'm going to move this into, see it's half, oop, too far. Three-eighths of an inch. And I'll lock this down. That three-eighths of an inch will be enough for the glass, the backing, and the picture, as well as some spikes to hold the picture in. Let me just double check that that didn't move. close enough. And then I want to set this depth stop to a quarter inch. And really the quarter inch doesn't matter precisely. I'm going to do it right about there. That's just going to end up being the size of the glass that I need. So right there. So there's my settings. And this is all ready to go. I now have my fence. This will ride along the wood. My depth stop tells me when I've cut deep enough. Now I just need to bring it over and run it along the wood. So let me zoom out a little bit. Back you up a hair and refocus. So you can see what I'm doing in this. Let me back up a little bit more. Once I get the camera sound figured out, I'm gonna have two cameras running so I can show this a little bit easier. Can I ask there. a question? What's that? And I don't know if you said it earlier because you know, I have my priorities. <laughs> but <laughs> where did you, did you say where you found your plane? Uh, this one, this Stanley 55 was actually given to me by a friend, well, kind of given to me. I, I traded him some work. Um, so he gave me the Stanley 55 and the cutters, um, and I made him a couple boxes and a tonguing plane and a grooving plane. Um, I have videos of those a while ago. Um, so if you want to see those, um, there's links. Actually, I probably don't have those in the description yet, but if you search uh, wood by right grooving plane or wood by right tonguing plane, you'll come across those videos. Um, 
so he traded me this. Um, I've seen them a few places. I saw them at an estate sale once, but they wanted 500 bucks. It was a great set. I was hardly ever used Stanley 55 with all the cutters. Um, if you go to um, a Midwest Tool Collectors Association meet, you're usually going to see three or four of them there. With the national event, you'll probably see a half dozen. Um, you can find them on eBay, but you're going to be pricey. Um, the 55 is very expensive. The 45, if you just get the base 45 with one cutter, you can usually find them for $45 or less. Um, and they'll do most everything the 55 will do. Here, let me show you. Uh, 45. Looks very similar. Uh, just has a few less bells and whistles. The second skate on the 55 goes up and down. Um, and there's a, there's a few other functionalities that the 55 will do, the 45 will do, that the 45 won't do. But the 45, for 90% of your work, that's a good workhorse. Um, yeah. So um, to hold this piece in place, um, I like to work between dogs on the vise here. Just makes it a little bit simpler for me. And I think I have the grain running the right direction here. We'll find out. And uh, one of the problems that some people have, especially if you're working with a thin piece, is being up close to the edge if you go between dogs. Um, but if you stand the piece up vertically, then there's enough space for the fence to slide down beside the wood. Now, some people are going to say you need to start here and take off a little bit at the end and work your way back. Um, I don't see much of a need for that with this. Some of the times with molding, I will. This is just fun. I love, I love working with the Stanley 55, making grooving and things of that nature. Now, with hickory being harder, I'm trying not to take off a heavy cut. Wait, we're not using white oak? Yes, I know. I'm not using white oak. White oak isn't hard enough for me right now. <laughs> Let me tighten this up a little bit, lest it slide. I was surprised no one had made that comment. <laughs> and this is going to take a couple minutes. So if anyone has a question, whoop, ran right off the end. Uh, now might be a good time. Well, they were wondering if you said you were going to use a 45 instead of a 55 originally. I may have misspoken myself. Uh, that's not the first, but anyways. <laughs> and then they have plain heavy. And be Whoa! Yes. One Blue Lagoon has a super chat. Hey, One Blue Lagoon, one of my uh -oh. favorite people. <laughs> what do Andrew Jackson and this picture frame have in common? What do Andrew Jackson and a picture frame have in common? I have no idea. Please tell me, Blue Lagoon. This sounds like a good joke for the podcast. While we're waiting, I can tell you what's the difference between Abraham and opium. Abraham and opium. Well, opium oh, is juice of the poppies, and Abraham, he's the poppy of the Jews. Hashtag dad jokes. Sorry. <laughs> Let me know when he posts that back up. <laughs> oh, apparently what they have in common is hickory or old hickory. Hickory? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I might have to use that in the podcast. I'm trying to remember what the... Uh, yeah, one of the interesting things is hickory um, used to natively grow in Europe. But it hasn't natively grown in Europe for a long, long time um, in recorded history. And that's why in Europe, usually the common tool to use for axe handles and such is ash, because ash is fairly common there. But in the U.S., hickory was the common wood. What? Um. One Blue Lagoon then also said, you could also say that they helped frame this nation. <laughs> On a roll tonight. I'm in with a good group here. Now you can see this is actually taking a good deal of time. And I really was going back and forth on showing um, this with the saw and cutting out both sides of the saw. Because the saw would probably end up taking about the same amount of time. I know that kind of surprises some people. Because you'd normally think a plane would be faster. All right. But uh, the plane can take a good deal of time. I'm down about an eighth inch, so I'm about halfway through this. What? Um, they're saying the audio delay. I don't know if that's the same audio delay problem we've been having. Uh-huh. 
Is the audio off from the action? Well, it says the audio delay is weird. Uh, yeah, if the audio is off from the action, I'm sorry. I'm trying to figure out what's causing that. And that's one of the reasons why I'm on one video this week, one camera this week. Because I'm trying to see if the, the video splitter I was using was causing the problem. But I haven't found out what's causing the problem. And as the video goes on longer, the problem becomes more and more. But, uh, one of these days, I will have a perfect live broadcast, and the world will end. I love these curls. So are there any questions? Not at the moment. Get so if anyone has any questions, go ahead and post them up. I'm probably going to have a couple times with this because I want to build the entire picture frame in this live session. So I have a couple times where I'm just doing tasks. I don't know if they're going to have any questions about woodworking, knowing the record history. <laughs> Well, no, we're not going to talk about nursing farts. Otherwise, I can start just talking about our day in general because it was a fun day for me. Well, besides carrying a very heavy golf bag, <laughs> guess who was the winner of our golf tournament? Oh, today? my wife schmooked me. She beat me by 10 points. I was just glad we didn't play 18. Otherwise, she would have beat me by 20. Yeah, and. <laughs> yeah, okay, won't go there. <laughs> Are you going, to, okay, so Aubrey Ken wants to work. are you going to add a molding to it? Yes, I'm going to do a little bit of trim work on this. I'm going to make it simple. I'm just going to do more or less a chamfer than a uh, hitting it with uh, molding planes. Um, I thought about doing something fun and funky, but I want to show the basics of how to do it. So once I get this done, we're going to flip it over and do a little bit of cleanup on it. Now, if this were pine, or even white oak, I would have been done by now. Now, so number one, I could take a little bit heavier cut. Number two, it's easier to push. But uh, when the bomb hits our place, um, this picture frame will still be standing. When <laughs> are we anticipating something? What's that? I said, are we anticipating something? That yes, I... when the bomb hits when our place. When the bomb. Let's see, I don't about a sixteenth inch away. That happens then. Um, so they say it's your audio, not mine. And then, um, okay, hang on. Woo. Uh, see, what I want to know: How would you do this without a plow plane? Um, the live video I did two weeks ago, I was making a grooving, uh, making a groove without a plow plane. I showed how to cut a long straight line, and the basic thing you can do is you cut. Because a rabbit is a cut this way and a cut this way. And if you make one long cut this way and you flip the board over, you make one long cut this way, you've got a rabbit. Plus, you get this little stick left over. Um, and I know that really scares a lot of people. It's, it's something that seems really intimidating and hard to do, but it's, it's not that difficult. So if you see that video, it shows you how to do that on a groove. It's the exact same thing for a rabbit. Getting close here. Down to depth, like here. Getting really close here. Let's see. <laughs> They're really on the jokes today. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, hang on. Um, you guys talking about nursing behind my back no, again? Oh, no, no. They're doing dad jokes. I'm surrounded by dad jokes. Um, I have a good audience. Yeah. <laughs> Candu was asking about a curfing plane. Yes. You could do the exact same thing with a curving plane. Um, curving plane is a saw with a fence. So basically it's, rather than having the cutter here, it's just a saw blade. So you cut a slot here, then you roll it over and you cut the slot there. Curving plane just makes it a little bit easier because you run against the fence rather than having to freehand the cut. I'm not as huge a fan of a curving plane. You'll often hear them also called a rabbiting plane because of that. All right, see me a rabbiting saw, not a rabbiting plane. I think I'm pretty close here. And so you can see, though a plane might seem faster and easier than a saw, it's still taking a good deal of time here. So I think I'm just down to the last little bits here. There we go. So now I have this perfect rabbit running all the way around. 
And in that we'll have the glass setting, and then we'll have the picture, and then we'll have the backing, and then there'll be enough space left over I can still get some, some tacks in there to hold it in place. And now I've got all these beautiful curls. I get people all the time asking me, what do you do with these curls? I throw them in the trash. Because <laughs> if I ever need curls, I can make them. Um, and I normally have too many curls, but uh, some people like to do flower beds with them. I used to do that, but they become more maintenance and they turn to, they turn colors over time, so I don't use them as much. Um, okay, now let's move on to um, the trim on this. First thing I have to do is clean this up a little bit because it is um, a bit dirty on the face. So I need to do the face and this edge because I just pulled this out of stock. And so to clean these up, I'm just going to grab a plane. Let's go to the 55. Let's put that back. I'm, I'm going to grab, grab a plane. <laughs> a smoothing plane. Yes. I'm going to grab a plane. I don't know which one I have. And probably going against, the, yep, going against the grain there. With hickory, going against the grain is uh, incredibly painful because hickory is a very, uh, it splits very easily along the wood, along the grain. And you'll get these runaway problems. So which one did you grab? Which one? Which plane? This is my smoothing plane. Ah. I have a little bit heavier cut than I normally have for a smoothing plane in it right now. It just allows me to march down the wood. I'm just trying to take off the saw marks because I got this from the mill. And so they ran it through a table saw to bring it to the thickness. And I'm not caring too much about thickness because I'm not taking off that much material. It's close to the same thickness all the way across, give or take a few hundreds. There we go, got that side smooth. And I'm going to do the face smooth. Yeah, one of the things about uh, live events is you get to see the real time effort that is required and how much work is needed. I'm going against the grain. And it really doesn't matter if I get a continuous cut from one end to the other now because I don't care about the thickness on the front as much. We're going to be doing a little bit of smoothing out on that in the future. I just want to clean it up a little bit before adding some trim to it. There we go. So, now I could just leave this as a rectangular frame. That's really ugly. Now I could go at it with uh, molding planes and get something really fancy. Like I know this plane isn't used for it, but I could do some weird OG around the edge. Get this looking really pretty. Um, but I don't want to do that. I want something simple. And if you know anything about my design, I like chamfers. Number one, they're easy. Number two, they're simple. Number three, they're easy. <laughs> they're, they're the type of thing you can add to a piece and it suddenly changes it and it really doesn't take much time at all. So I'm going to put this up on an angle. Now what I could do is I could come in here with a pencil and mark a line here and then mark a line here and make sure that everything is precise. I could come in with a marking gauge and I could mark a line here and mark a line here and make sure everything is precise. But I don't want to do that. I like shooting from the hip. I like being wild. I like grabbing my four and a half and cleaning this up with a heavier cut than that because it's like nothing. I'm just going to count my passes. Two. And this will give me a chamfer. And as long as I count my passes and I keep it relatively close to 45, I'll get these really cool curls. And I'll know that these angles are pretty close to each other. Ooh. Until you slide off the edge like that. But oh well. We're not looking for perfection, we're just looking for something that's close. Because I slid off there, I'm going to start here. And just adding a chamfer like this will make it look finished. 
and we'll add a bit of style, but it won't take much time at all. It's nice and simple. I really need to put some leather back on the bottom of my shoes. The wooden shoes on this concrete floor slide a good bit. They're not as much as many people think. There. I could do it a lot deeper and heavier than that, but I'm not. And so let's do it on this corner. Just simple. If you notice, I flipped it end for end, so I know I'm not going against the grain, or at least I shouldn't be, unless this dives in a weird angle. Here, let me turn the angle this way so you get the curls coming out towards you. Oops. Sorry, wrong way. I want to turn it this way. Skipped it again. love these long curls. You know, a lot of people get into hand tools because they think that it is, um, it's a more romantic way of doing things. But they stay in woodworking for the curls. And yes, I have my own collection of curls in jars up above my shop. sorts of different tips and tricks for using their wood, your wood, the wood curls. Um, <laughs> some people say they can do it for the zen or the cardio for woodworking with hand tools. Um, but Stephen goes, one question is, you use hardwood instead of soft wood. Blech. Are you concerned with the hardwood wood denying your work or is the soft wood denying instead of the work? I don't know. I don't know what he's saying. Soft versus hardwoods, I guess. What was the question again? I don't know. That's, that's what I read. All right, no, I couldn't hear you. Listen, man. I do <laughs> Sorry. it for the ladies. Okay, Steve, did I get that question right first? Claire, can you type in and see? He was saying, are you concerned with the hard, word, hard, hard wood denying your work, whereas the soft wood dent instead of the work? Oh, uh, you're talking about the hardwood bench? Oh, maybe. That, um, mm, that makes sense. Can some people like a there? really hard wood bench like a maple. My old bench is made out of Douglas fir. Um, and if your bench is soft and you bump your work on it, then the bench will dent and not the work. Uh, whereas if your bench is hard and you're working in something soft, then the bench might dent the work. But as long as you're careful, dents generally don't happen. Um, I like the... Uh, I think if I had my druthers, um, I would do either soft maple or well like a box elder which is a soft maple uh, i think that's about the right softness but i love the look of the white oak and i had a lot of white oak in stock so that's why i chose white oak so there is our picture frame now we need to cut angles in this and that's where people go <gasps> um, and i did it one time too and then i started cutting angles and i realized that there's no reason to worry about it they're actually not that hard so what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab out my bench hook. Dropping things again. And last time I did this, I had a whole lot of people um, worried and complaining about my bench hook. And my piece of wood miss went missing. Oh, well. I have another piece of wood I set out here that's the same thickness. But that'll do for now. Um, because I was cutting out here on the end freehand. And some people noticed, hey, you've got these slots in here. Why don't you use those slots? And the reason I don't use those slots is I don't use those slots. Um, I just, I've never gotten into using the slots, and I don't know if I trust them that much. Um, but, I mean, I can use these slots and, and cut an angle, so I think I'm going to do that tonight because I can. Um, so I want to keep in mind the rabbit that I have is on the inside. So that's always the small, the small angle of the wood. 
So I'm going to start over here by cutting an angle. And I'm just going to cut a random angle here. And I'm just going to trust my slot. I'm not going to make any marks on this. Oops, sliding out. Oh, why am I having so much problem here? I'm just going to trust my slot for right now. I know my slot is a little ways off. But that's fine because I'm going to be fixing it up with a shooting board or a miter trimmer. Oh, why am I having so much issue tonight? I'm going to go back to cheating again. Tonight? I think every life yeah. had an issue. Come on. Sometimes it really works well for me, but once you go with these harder woods... Like what was I using last time? It's really hard wood. It was sliding around. Oh, it was maple. That's right. Was it maple? No, it was something hard. No, it was oak. Oh, it was the old oak. That's right. And this saw is getting dull. Now, one of the things I know about the slot is it's not perfectly true right on 45 degrees. And honestly, that's not too much of a problem because I can clean it up a little bit later. Now the next thing I need to do is I need two pieces to go along the top and two pieces to go along the bottom that are identical in length. If the length is off a little bit, I don't really matter, as long as those two pieces are exactly the same length. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put my picture on here, and I'm going to make a nick at the length of this picture, because I want this picture to be just popping out behind... Um, I want this to be just barely covered by the frame. So, make a nick there, grab my angle, put that on there, and then I'm going to stay away from that line. This line is just to give me a bit of guidance, so I know where to put it on this. So now I can come on here, just go ahead and clamp it again. Where's that line? There it is. Line that up closely with that, right there. Not wanting it to be dead on yet, we'll do that with the shooting board. And is that going to get in there? Yes, that's going to get in there. There. And we're going to cut this again. getting a bit dull. Oh well. Slide it over here. And then I'm going to make the next start cut here. And i got to do this eight times. So if you have any questions, right now might be a good time. So you're asking me questions. They don't want to. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they can put in their questions. I'm trying to answer theirs real quick. Oh. Okay, I'm just going to answer it live then if you're okay. Sure. Rather than me trying to type it. All right, so there was a question of when James told me that you wanted to get into the whole handful of woodworking. Because you're real quiet right now, too. Uh, what was your reaction? What, was, what do you think about now that he's come so far? One, I wasn't surprised you got into hand tools. Um, but because you have always done woodworking, and I think we just gotten rid of a lot of your power, power tools because we'd moved so much in the last few years. Um, I was just more shocked that there was such a community of hand tool woodworking people and that you liked watching James. Sometimes it's hard when you're this close to <laughs> reality. Maybe I should put it that way. <laughs> but I'm excited. And then I get to join all you lovely people. So. She thinks you guys are lovely. Uh, yeah. She hasn't been here long enough, apparently. That's okay. Well... <laughs> They like you, so. <laughs> That's uh -oh, the point. Oh, my sound is low. Yeah, um, when I'm sawing, if you want to talk, um, do you see the plug with the red and, and black no, over farther? Oh, hang on. Hang on, folks. What red? Mm, nope. This one? Um, no, like nope. fourth line over from the right. One more. That one? Uh, does that one have a... Here, let me just go look at it. You can turn me off anytime you want. 
with this knob here. That's that is not off. red. That is white. That's, well, the red and black here, sorry. Oh, that, okay, can you hear me now? Uh, yeah, if you turn me off, then they'll be able to hear you over by sawing. Wonderful. Oh, and Mary oh, Roberts... I gave my wife the, pro the power to turn me Ooh. off. Uh, Ray Roberts wants to know where the miter slicer is. I will be using that here in a minute. That doesn't work for just slicing through wood. That cleans up a lot like a shooting board does. Um, but I'm going to be showing that and the shooting board and showing both methods. Because picture frames, that's where really that comes in handy. It is it's really That's lovely. Can you see my hand? <laughs> oh, and Aubrey Kuhn says you need to get a um, photo with Roy Underhill one of these days. <laughs> yeah, I had, uh, had lunch with him a while ago, but uh, now I would love to go down to his shop and shoot a video at the school, that'd be a lot of fun. I need to get down there. Um, plus, he has a store in his base in his uh, attic with a lot of fun tools for sale. Well, earlier they were saying your Stanley Fifty Five looked like a steampunk uh, relic of some sort. Yeah, and it made me think of it a video. Time I could see a video from you coming up steampunk style. So who knows? All right. Let's get caught up with that. Now, the other thing I could do is grab out my miter box, but I really don't like using that as much. Okay, so now I have this. I have a long side and I have a short side. And I want to make two other pieces that are identical. So I'm going to flip this one over upside down on the one I just did. And I'm going to take my marking knife and I'm going to mark that one. So I know it's really darn close. I don't care if it's dead on because I'm going to be cleaning them up later when I get to the uh, uh, miter trimmer. Now, if you are going to exact precise measurement, then make them bigger than you need to. That way when you come closer with the shooting board, then you can uh, get it exactly where you need it to be. cuts to make. Any questions from the audience or things I should know uh, about? No, they were saying the sound and quality is better. Cool. Is my mouth in time with my talking or the sawing in time with the, the sound? Um, I haven't heard anyone talk about that yet. so I have no idea. But uh, they started talking about Japanese saws, so I got to... Have you, you ever used a Japanese saw? Yeah, it's not going to work. I don't have a back support because the Japanese saw cuts on the pole stroke. But uh, if I had a, uh, a cutting board with this, I could, uh, if I had a stop on the back here, I could pull against that. Some people like them. I'm not some people. How about, okay, hang on, I gotta go back up. Uh, have you figured out any special woodworking for using the Japanese saws? I know you kind of talked about that the other time. But... Um, I have a video on when I use them, when I don't use them. I don't use them that often. Um, a lot of people starting off like them because they're easier to control. Well, in actuality, they are harder to control, which means they go in a straighter line. Whereas a western saw is very easy to control, but any Ooh, small sorry. amount of movement makes the saw go all over the place. So that makes it harder to learn, um, though a little bit of movement puts a lot of control into it. Um, kind of counterintuitive what people think, but... <laughs> different saws for different people. Nope, they say your audio and sound, or motion and sound are out of sync still by a second. Okay, I'll have to try it again next week. One 
more cut. So now I have two pieces that are long. So I'm gonna grab this other short piece, bring it over here, set that on, and then use the marking knife to mark out where that one is. Now I know these are relatively close, though the sawing is a bit wild. I can line them up. One more cut. Then we can go on to the fun part. Really need to sharpen that saw. <laughs> I haven't sharpened that one in oh, a year or more, so it is most definitely time to sharpen it. So let me show you the shooting board method that I use, because I had a lot of people tell me last time um, I should have used a shooting board when making that miter, because the shooting board is so much easier. Um, I really don't think that a shooting board is that much easier than doing it freehand. Um, it's just personal preference. A lot of people like it. I'm not one of those lot of people. Um, but choose what you like. So I'm going to show you what I do on a cheap shooting board. I have a video for making this shooting board a while ago. And the problem with it is I don't have a 45 degree setting on here. So what I can do is I can grab this and use it as my 45 degree setting. I just need to space it up a hair. Grab, that'll do fine, because that angle's off ever so slightly right now. And now what I can do is I can grab these pieces, put them on here, and then I can shoot them at precisely 45 degrees. It just takes a little bit more finagling to hold it in place. One of these days I might actually build a bona fide, real um, mitered shooting board. I'll do one or two with this, show you basically what I'm going to do. Cutting. Oh, it's because this blade's dull. <laughs> I think you need I've got everything dull cut. today. <laughs> I I keep putting things off. It's like, why isn't this cutting? Because this blade is dull. So normally it just slides right through it, but because I'm working at it, I'm cutting too much. And you can see here, I've cleaned up this area, but not that. So if my blade was sharp, I would just go through this and march them down. But my blade isn't sharp. So I'm going to go on to my new favorite tool. Maybe one of these days I'll actually test my tools beforehand and say, oh, I'm going to sharpen that. They actually just want to watch you sharpen, I think, occasionally once in a while. Oh! Wow, that was loud. And trick. Maybe I'll do that. I'll do a video sometime of showing sharpening, sharpening a few different things. That actually might be a good idea. Thank you, whoever said that. So this is a miter trimmer. It's also known as a finger slicer. Uh, <laughs> medieval guillotine. There's a bunch of different uh, rules for it. But the nice thing is you can set this up to precisely 45 degrees. Then I can put this block of wood in here. And I can go, actually slide right up there. Slide this a little past. Okay, a little more. And I can trim off a very small amount as long as I can move it. So I can go. Oh, let me set this down. Oh, I'm moving too fast. I'm gonna slow myself down here. Let's see if I can get this to grab. I oiled my bench top the other day, and all the oil went down in my dog holes. So my hold fast. Some of them are having issue with some of the dog holes. So I'm trying to give them a snap. But they're not going to bite, are they? I'm gonna, oh, then we got it. Good. Let's see if this one will grab it. It's got some more grip on it. 
<laughs> that one popped. Okay, plan B, um, just use a clamp. When all else fails, clamp it. Kind of wondering why you didn't do that first. Put it off of that. And on to there. Sorry about that. All right, so let's do this. Hickory is a difficult, difficult wood, but you can see how that just cleans it up. Really nice edge. Come on. Ah, my hand keeps sliding. Okay. I'm trying to move too fast here because um, I'm being... One of the things when you get a video, you get... Uh, I don't know how Roy Underhill does it. 23-minute uh, videos, doing it a lot, a lot live. Um, I really have a lot of respect for that guy in a video. But uh, I'm pushing myself too fast here. So what I'm doing is I'm hitting this point, and then the wood is sliding back away rather than holding it in place. Some of the professional picture shops actually have big jaw monsters that... Uh, oh, come on. Not feeling good all of a sudden. Um, have big jaw monsters that will clamp everything in place. Okay, now you're moving. Why are you moving? Oh, because you're not. <laughs> My fence is sliding on me. Let's clamp that down a good bit. There, let's see if that helps. What? <laughs> so, B power. B, oh shoot, that was my phone. Um, I think his reply for uh, Roy Underhill's. <laughs> he probably sharpens his tools first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm having an issue with that side, so let's try this other side. Oh, and that one's not even set right, is it? Nope, I've never used the other side on this one yet. Okay. Um. Let's move on to plan B. Plan I thought that C? was plan B. <laughs> this was plan B, yeah. Let me go back and sharpen. i actually show you how to sharpen. I might actually split this up into two because, oh, yeah, we're coming up on 15 minutes. And I would like to do splines on this. So I might, you know what? Let me just call it tonight, and we'll do another live, and we'll finish this up another later. That way I'm not pushing myself and not uh, giving you guys sharpening and that type of thing. Maybe I will do a sharpening video later. But... <laughs> uh, live videos are always fun. You never know what you're going to get. Um, yeah, so I'm learning, and uh, a lot of other people are... Uh, <laughs> thanks. Man. So, oh, hey, one blue lagoon. Thanks, man. Um, so, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll pick this up next time, and we will continue this project. I'm going to sharpen this and figure out why that uh, blade is sliding on there, and we will make this thing purdy because I really want to do a good job on this because in the future project, what we're actually going to be doing is when we clamp them together, then we're also going to be putting in a spline. And uh, I want to show how do you do a simple butt joint and a spline and do them very strong and functionally um, as opposed to just gluing them together and hoping they stick. Uh, because a lot of people will glue them together and then put a bracket on the back to hold them together. Um, it just doesn't work so well. How do you get an accurate clean 45 to go together, spline them and have a joint that you know is going to hold for a long time? And uh, maybe next time I won't do it in hickory. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Um, oh, I sh man, I forgot about that. I'm, you can tell I'm sweating a little bit. I'm wearing the wrong shirt because I just got in shirts in my store. Um, so if anyone was looking forward to oh, getting those, um, they're in there as well as I got puzzles back in stock. Um, so we'll be having a few other things coming into that. But I want to say thank you to those of you who have come out for this. <laughs> a fun ride as always. And uh, we'll be doing uh, more fun in the future here. So... Let me know your thoughts if there's anything you'd like to see, and we'll make these lives better and better as we go. So that is one of the things that I'm doing. And if any of you have wondered, um, if you look at the Wood by Wright show, um, the Wood by Wright channel, uh, if you go back and watch my earliest videos, uh, the process of this channel isn't about perfection and really nice woodworking. Uh, I really wanted to show everything I have. So the first video I have is, hey, I just bought my first hand plane. And so you can see the entire progression of me with hand tools from my very first tool to now. So you actually get to see not only how do I do it, what have I learned, and how do I do things, 
Um, but how I learned it and what I have changed along the way. And I'll say some things in earlier videos that I completely am different now. And uh, so a lot of people like to go back and look at that and say that, you know, I'm not perfect. I like to show my flaws because I want to show the learning process as well. So I hope you like that. Um, I know it's not for everyone, but I like it. So, yeah. Um, request for topic. Uh, the hand woodworker approach to stabilizing wood, if possible. Uh, hmm. That might be interesting. We'll see. Uh, I've never actually stabilized wood. I I've thought about doing it for a couple of turning projects, but that might be fun to play with. So thank you for that. Uh, one, one blue lagoon again. Thanks, man. Um, yeah, unless, are there any questions to answer? There were, there was one, I promised. Oh, here. I, I promised, I promised Back I would this ask up a little this bit. one. So I'm not leaning over. All right, so People's Woodshop wanted to know, uh, totally off subject, um, if you had any tips on getting started with building a profitable shop, um, you're gearing up to make live edge round tables so that he can quit his job. Um, live edge tables are actually a really good way to make money fairly quickly. Um, and if you're wanting to make things to sell things, hand tools are nice for some of the joinery and finishing, but hand tools do not make you money in the long run. Um, power tools are, are needed if you're wanting to do things. It's one of the reasons why I don't sell anything is I don't do, uh, you know, if I were to make something, it would be several thousand dollars for a simple project. Uh, whereas with hand tools, I can make it a lot cheaper. Um, so number one, uh, if you're doing it for profit and selling things, you're gonna need to invest in power tools. And I would like to actually show some more of that in the future and actually showing where are power tools useful, where are hand tools useful, and going back and forth. A hybrid shop can be a really valuable thing, especially when you learn both skills. Um, for me, my woodworking is very different because I'm a content creator. I'm not, um, I don't sell woodworking, so it's not my best question. Uh, but we do talk about it a lot on the, uh, the podcast, the, the Creators Collective. So if you want to see that, um, we have several episodes that touch on that quite a bit. Um, yeah, so I hope that answers your question. What else you got? Okay, so I just got one. And if I skipped over one, I'm sorry. It's kind of been a long post. Um, Aubrey Queen just said, how do you determine where in the stock to put the blade when making a wood-bodied plane? Where in the stock? Um, I'm assuming you are talking about, pull this one down. I'm assuming you're talking about where to put the iron up front or in the back. Um, usually the rule of thumb is that the mouth is one third of the way from the front. Uh, because you want to have more sole in the back so you can keep it flat when pushing it through the wood. Um, that's a rule of thumb though. There is no perfect precise that this is the right place to put it. Um, I've seen a lot of old planes where the mouth is right in the middle of it, uh, but most of them the mouth is in the, 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 the last um, third of the plane. So that's kind of the, the rule of thumb to follow. Hope that was what you were looking for. So. Any more? Uh, Robert Smith said, what would you recommend as a college ma major to master woodworking? A college major? Um, if you're going into it for business, get a business degree. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, that, yeah. Uh, I think that's the, the problem. That I was going to say trial have. and error. <laughs> yeah, they don't have a, a business degree. But if you're looking for um, how to be you know, a problem solver and functioner, um, make sure they're stuck. Um, how to do problem solving and things like that. Um, I, I really don't know. Um, my back, my master's work was in uh, was in technical theater. My undergrad was in biblical counseling, so I don't think any of those really <laughs> really help. Um, You're just a well-rounded. You know, individual. I'd probably say just get um, going to a um, what's the word I'm looking for um, a trade school um, as opposed to you know getting a, a, a bachelor's or an associate's. Um, a lot of those hands-on skills really transfer really well. Um, and you learn a lot more quicker and much, much cheaper. So that would be probably what I would, I would do if I'm wearing that. But I, don't know. I really like uh, technical theater. You get to experience a lot of different materials and a lot of different functionalities and problem solving is really high up on the list. So that was mine. Cool. Um, that's it. Tracy from Mother's Day. Thank I you. Know. Well, you missed the whole beginning of the chat because oh. you were picture frame, la la la. And they're like, oh, why aren't you doing it for Mother's Day? <laughs> <laughs> and then I said, after you decided to stop, I said, whew, good thing you didn't plan on making it for Mother's Day. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm looking forward to finishing this project. That was kind yeah. of. Yeah. 
I wasn't sure if I can get it all done one one hour with the splines. Um, but yeah, if I sharpen oh, this and oh, figure out oh. that, we'll work on it. Hang on. Um, good. Re Jordan Brewer says, "What are some good resources to learn about species identification and such tree species?" Um, with tree species, there's a bunch of different things you look at. Um, you can it, just looking at the tree itself. You look at its bark. You look at its fruit. You look at its leaves. Um, you look at the organization of how the branches flow. Um, and a lot of it is just kind of um, figuring things out. There's several good apps um, that I uh, that I've used in the past. Uh, I can't think of them right now. I have, a, I have a video on identifying trees, and I have all the apps and resources I have listed on that. Um, I don't like books as much because they aren't as broad. Um, but if you get an app, you, you can look at and be like, um, I think this might be an elm. And you look up pictures of an elm, and you can kind of compare it. And the more you do that, and you just kind of go back and forth between pictures and reality and pictures and reality, you start to obviously recognize things about different trees. Um, and I like to go to the park and just walk through the park and identify tree and tree and tree and tree. <laughs> Oh, what is that one? And I'll go look it up in the app and I'll find something that's fairly close. And eventually you get really good at identifying them and saying, this is that. And my wife hates walking through the park with me because I'll be like, oh, look at this white oak. And look or at that go, go to that tree and I have no clue and which tree like, we're going. They're trees. What's the difference? <laughs> <laughs> you can't cut them down and use them anyways. <laughs> yes. Why won't the park let me cut down the trees? All right. Hang on. There's a couple. Um... How, here we go. Santos says, how do you sharpen your chisels and plain blade, sharpening stone or grinding machine? Um, I have a pile of sharpening videos. Um, so I have a, just about every tool I have in the shop, I have a video on sharpening that particular iron. Um, I don't use a grinder. Um, I have a hand power grinder and I have a foot power grinder I want to restore, um, but I don't use those. Um, if I need to grind off a lot of material, I will get like a 36 or a 50 grit sandpaper, really, really, really coarse sandpaper, and I'll put it down on the concrete and I'll just rub it off on that. And that actually goes really fast, um, a lot faster than people expect. Um, and that gets me fairly close and then I can take it over to my sharpening system on my stones. Um, and I use the DMT diamond plate stones um, and I have a link to these and most all of my sharpening videos because that's the system that I like. Um, coarse, medium, and fine, and then a strop. Really nice, sharp, clean surface. What else you got? Um, oh. Now you're talking about blah, blah, blah. I love seeing all the conversations that go on behind my back. I th okay, oh, I thought I skipped one, but I'm going to have to. All right, if I skipped it, I'm sorry. Uh, Night Cactus says, on the same topic, how do you know when the wood is dry enough to use if using found wood or green wood? Um, actually, I have a couple videos on that as well as uh, of using meters. Um, there's a couple different ways. Number one, you can use a meter that will give you a number. It is 15% moisture. Um, and the number really means nothing. Uh, you, if, you, if you sent me a number and said, hey, my wood is at 16%, is it dry enough to use? I have no idea. I don't know what your shop condition is. I don't know what the wood type of wood is. I don't know um, what the humidity in your area is. Um, I don't know in the ebb and flow of the yearly cycle for you. Um, and so it, it's kind of hard to judge that. Um, what I like to do is I'll cut off a small piece of the wood and I'll keep that beside the stack. And that small piece of wood will dry much faster than the large piece of wood. And so I'll test that dry, small piece of wood. And when that small piece of wood, it's, it's moisture level stops moving. Then I know that's its ambient uh, moisture level for that time in that area. And then I'll put it on the main board and wait until that main board matches the small scrap that I cut off. Um, you can also weigh it and you can weigh the board and when the weight of the board stops dropping and it stays at the same weight for a while, then you know it's, it's reached its ambient uh, moisture level. That can be very hard with big boards, but if you're working with small, more manageable things, that's actually a fairly accurate way of doing it. Um, but I have a, a video on a couple other methods and, and what I like to do in my shop. Okay, uh, two more, I think. Okay. People switch up. Uh, what's a good way to tell if you have southern yellow pine without cutting into it? I don't know southern yellow pine, actually. Um, I'm not very good at identifying pine trees. Um, so, sorry, you got the wrong person. Um, I'm also not as good with the southern trees. I know some of them because I spent a while in Alabama and Georgia that I've, I can identify some. Uh, but pine trees particularly uh, have never really interested me unless it's like white pine. I think that has something to do with me like, liking white oak as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but uh, um, actually, no, that was because that was the first tree I learned to identify because white pine has these long needles 
and there's five of them. So you know, W H I T E, right? W H I T E. So right? right. I spelled the word right. <laughs> <laughs> so I remember doing that once. This is a white pine. W I T E, light. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, then there's also um, a, I think, yeah, red well, pine. Those were um, also Christmas trees. So which has three I... needles. Um, and yeah, and some of the Christmas trees I can identify, such as uh, Fraser Firs. Well, but that's um, because but those, that was you your really family's tradition, yeah. is white pine. Um, All right. But yeah, I'm not as good with pine trees, so sorry about that. And then uh, Robert Smith says, he remembers a while back, you mentioned a meetup when and where will the next one be at? <laughs> uh, well, I, I'm thinking about doing a meetup when I go to the Midwest Tool Collectors Association meet. Um, but I haven't set that up yet. So if anyone is near Lansing and wants to find a location for it, let me know. Uh, maybe we can put, up, put together a meetup while I'm there. Uh, Thursday might actually be a good time for that Thursday night um, of that meeting. Um, but I also want to do a meetup at the local makerspace here in Rockford. Um, it'll be opening June 6th, no, June 9th, I think it is, is the official opening of the makerspace. And so I want to do a meetup there. I'm also thinking about possibly doing one here at my house and I'm burning a lot of my scrap lumber and saying, hey, come save lumber from James's scrap pile before I burn it. And <laughs> you know, people come over for a cookout and cooking hot dogs and things. I thought that'd be kind of fun. Um, but uh, we'll see. I might might not do that. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, none of those are um, on the books yet. Although I probably have to look at the one for uh, Midwest Tool Collectors in June. That will be coming up pretty soon. So we'll see. If anyone's in Lang Lansing, Michigan, let me know. I'd love to maybe get a contact location. All right, one more. Oh, is boy. three is, sorry is three quarters inch thick enough for the seat portion of a saw bench? And if so, what joinery would you use to attach legs to it? Yeah, mine is, uh, uh, my saw bench is three quarter inch thick. Um, I have um, plans uh, for a saw bench is what I do. Um, I just have, it's basically like a finger joint except for the, the top board, the fingers of the, the leg just go straight up through the seat and so the board continues on through. Um, and three quarter inch, if it's a long distance, you might get some deflection in there. And so I do have a, um, a vertical piece supporting the seat underneath. Um, but yeah, mine's, mine's three quarter inch. But if you wanna see that, I have a couple videos on making that saw bench as well as plans on the website. I think they're five bucks for the plan, so pretty cheap. That it? I think so. She's not gonna say one more? I'm um, no. <laughs> so uh, that's about it for this week. And uh, we'll come back next week and finish this up and I'll, <laughs> I'll sharpen my plane for you. <laughs> Sorry about no, that. No, we got to show the video of that. Come on. Come on. No <laughs> shortcuts. You're not Roy. We know it. It's all good. I like showing you reality here. And normally if problems like this come up with my video, uh, well, then that's the great point about actual videos is I can stop it and sharpen the plane and then do it. Uh, whereas with live, that doesn't always work. So, yeah, that's about it for this week. Until next time. Have a Night. wonderful day. Good night. You got to hit the stop button. I know. Oh. <laughs>